Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us. Thank you so much for joining us today for a very, very exciting conversation. And it's to discuss the fight for racial equality in Arab communities, whether in the US or abroad, back home. So my name is Noor Ghadanfar. I am an urban planner based in Houston, Texas, and I'm also a member of the MIT Arab Alumni Association. And we really wanted to host a space to have this special webinar because we felt that it was important and imperative with everything that's been going on to really discuss the issues that are happening in the US and how they permeate um, in Arab communities, both in the US and abroad. And I think it's a really important question to discuss. And I read this beautiful quote today that I think is super applicable. When there is space for voices, there is room for hope. And I think that's exactly what we're trying to do today is create a space for um, people from all backgrounds to come and discuss um, racial justice and racial equality. And the speakers today here, we have an incredible lineup um, and I'm really excited for you to just join in on the conversation. I will introduce our moderator today who is Dina Atiya and she is currently an MIT undergraduate student um, she's incredible and she'll be moderating the discussion. And one of the reasons we wanted to have an undergraduate moderate specifically this discussion is because we feel that we need to be involving not just alumni, right? We want to be involving all different types of people, all backgrounds, all ages in this conversation because it is important. So I hope you enjoy the discussion today and I'm sure like myself, we'll all take out so much from it. Thank you. Go ahead, Dina. Everyone, thank you again so much for, for joining us. Uh, we're super duper excited. I, when I was asked to do this and I saw the people I was gonna get to talk to, I was in shock, I was super excited. Uh, and I hope you guys are excited too. Uh, so let me introduce our, uh, our incredible speakers. First is Ishdal um, Abdel Qadir, who is a 2018-2019 uh, Hubert Humphrey Fellow at the Department of Urban Planning and Studies at MIT. During her fellowship, she also received courses and training at Harvard, uh, as well as Syracuse and Northeastern University. She's currently a senior urban planner in Khartoum, Sudan, and a, and a PhD researcher. Her work is in the indigenous neighborhoods, which evolved more than a century ago in Sudan. She, she tries to study the, the concepts and principles that were adopted at that time as these neighborhoods were were planned by the original settler by the original by the original settlers to, to satisfy their social cultural and environmental needs her research revealed a rich heritage of urban knowledge in these neighborhoods her interests also span things like women's empowerment youth development um, and and she and she does a lot of really incredible work in in Sudan where she believes that many of the pressing issues facing the community can be tackled by adopting urban planning uh, and strategies. So if everyone, if everyone could like virtually applause react uh, for, for Ijlal. Thank you. Uh, next up is Khaled Al Bey, who is a, is a Romanian born uh, and, and Qatari raised, but originally Sudanese artist and political cartoonist. Um, he currently lives and works in Copenhagen, Denmark, where he is, uh, wh where he is the International a Cities of Refuge Network, or ICORN, um, artist in residence. He has a ridiculously long list of, of um, accolades. He is the 2018 inaugural Soros Arts Fellow for the Open Society Foundation, was the 2016 Oak Fellow at the Oak Institute for the study of international human rights at, at Colby in Maine. Um, and and he, um, he publishes uh, really great political cartoons on social media under the name Khartoum, which is a, a playoff of Khartoum, Sudan, uh, and cartoon, uh, which I thought was really funny. Uh, and you guys should definitely 
check out his artwork. I uh, stalked his Instagram when I when I found out that this was happening. Uh, next we have, oh wait, first applause reacts for him. And uh, and finally we have we have we have Rana Abdel Hamid who is um, who has been doing incredible organization and activist work for for years. She founded uh, she founded Marika, which is a uh, which is a global grassroots movement that is committed to to building safety and power for all women through self defense, healing justice, uh, as well as community organizing and financial literacy. She founded this at the age of sixteen uh, after. An unfortunate incident uh, where she was attacked by a stranger who tried to remove her hijab, uh, but she incredibly turned that into uh, an experience that that allowed her to help others, and she's been doing so since. She she um, she has a lot of, of of more interesting stuff in her bio that you can read. But I uh, have actually I don't know if you remember this, Rana, but we've actually met a couple times before um, at. At a Model UN conference a few years ago, I mistook her for a high school student, uh, but she was actually the uh, the speaker for the opening address. I just got really excited that there was another person there wearing hijab, and I was like, "Oh my God, which committee are you in?" And she was like, "No, I'm like the main event," uh, but in much more humble words. Uh, and then uh, she she also led a uh, a self defense uh, workshop at Miss Boston which I attended and I told her the first story and we laughed about it then too. So this is like a really cool, like third round full circle moment. Um, so virtual applause for her as well. It's a great story. <laughs> uh, so yeah, as as I hope I've proven to you guys, the, the people that we're talking to know what they're talking about. They've been doing really important work for a long time and this is gonna be great, but I should stop talking about them and start talking to them. Uh, so my first question for you guys, and you can unmute yourselves in whatever order, um, and and just like answer whichever questions you, you you think you have something to say about. So the first question is that we're talking to two different demographics here uh, when we talk about uh, tackling the issue of of racial equality in Arab communities, because there are Arab Americans, and then there are people actually living in Arab countries, and I think that there is potential for the, the problem of race to be very different in those two areas. So I wanna ask based on, on what you guys know and the work you've done, how do you think the problem is different for Arab Americans versus in actual Arab countries? Should start. Can, can you please uh, uh, I didn't catch the question oh, uh, so the question is um, Just, how, how is the the problem of racial inequality different uh, for Arab Americans versus in Arab countries? I think it's a, um, you know, in, in I think in America, I, I think everywhere actually, even in, in, in the Arab world or, or, or in the United States, the, the first generation or like the, you know, our parents' generation could carry some of, um, some of that racism that's left over. But, um, it's normally our generation that is trying to change things. You know, they're trying to be more accepting. They're trying to look at, uh, you know, tribalism in a different way. And in, 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 from my experience, in some societies, it, 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 um, people are working on it. But it's, it's very. I think it's very. I think it's very hard because it's, uh, you know, the, the Arab, uh, the Arab culture is is very tribal. You know, um, and and. Um, it, it's it's you know 
it's and it was powered this 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 tribalism was powered by colonialism and it was you know and and now even after that it's we're still trying to dismantle um leftovers of that so it's it's uh it's incredible i think it's incredibly hard to uh to just you know wake up one day and say oh well you know we're not racist anymore that's not gonna, <laughs> that's not gonna work you know so it's uh it it, it will it will take time um uh, but in 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 the in the United States, I think it should be definitely should be a lot uh, easier uh, because of the surroundings, because of the mix uh, of cultures and 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 uh, and what's going on. But it's a uh, it's it's everywhere. It's really it's really rooted and and sadly kind of became the norm. And again, I, I really apologize. My 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 uh, my neighbors are having a. a crazy party right now so you know enjoy the music while i uh, talk that sounds amazing the party um thank you thank you Khaled. i'm happy i'm i'm happy to jump in here um so so just in terms of context and positionality i'm speaking as um you know someone who's most most of my racial justice work has been rooted in the united states um and i'm speaking as someone who is n not black um, who's a brown Arab, um, who has, you know, obviously a, a, a level of privilege on this panel. And so I'm going to be mindful and, and also just the space that I'm taking up. But to talk about kind of the the global implications and the global resonance of this, it's been very interesting. Like as I'm putting out like some content to Arab speakers, the number one reaction that I've been getting is that this is a problem in the US. It's not a problem in North Africa and the Middle East. It's not a problem in the Arab world. We don't have this problem, right? And I think it's really important for us to really remember that white supremacy is a global phenomena, that anti-blackness is a global phenomena, that white supremacy stems from colonization, just like Khaled said, right? It's like a, it's a huge issue that we have internalized as global communities because of our experiences with European, um, various levels of European violence. The histories and the ways they've manifested are very different, right? So we could talk about the enslavement of African people and the ways that it manifested in the US, but we could also talk about the enslavement of Black Africans also across the North and, and the ways in which North Africa um, and the Arabian Peninsula facilitated, for, facilitated that enslavement as well, right? So it's not like these are two completely different realities. And then, and, and then we could, then there's like the superficial level of, or the micro level that we, we might experience, right, of anti-Blackness, where you could talk about media and culture and the way it manifests, right, in both cultures and structurally how it manifests in both cultures, right? So in the Arab world, in the North African world, you, you're not just going to talk about, um, you know, colorism, divorcing it from a kafela system, right? You're not going to talk about, um, you know, how individuals might laugh at blackface and divorce it from the ways in which we treat um, sub-Saharan migrants, right? That come up into Egypt, that come up into Libya and the, the violence that they experience. And so these are really, very real issues um, that our communities need to very honestly reflect on and, and reckon with so that we might, we collectively can challenge white supremacy, so we can collectively challenge anti-Blackness in all the ways in which it manifests. Thank you, Greg, so much. Uh, Isabel, are you? Yes, I, I'm in now, yes. <laughs> so uh, I think it's really a global problem. It's a global issue. And uh, in many communities, it's, uh, as we say in Arabic, al they, they, it's not it does not come into play. No one is mentioning such issue. And um, especially when it comes to marriage issues for the children, for the girls, uh, then there are great problems they arise in, uh, in this area. But, but I think we should, this is the time that we should come together and speak about this issue and try to put concrete solutions to uh, tackle this problem, but lightly, because if it's going to be uh, harshly, then I think it's going to get a negative effect. So lightly, I think we can tackle these issues because we have uh, uh, very strong use Throughout the Arab countries, they were able to overthrow the, the regimes. So I think they are capable now to handle this change in the, uh, 
the, 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 the thoughts of the people, the thoughts of our genera the generations before us, our generations and the coming generations to come. So I am hopeful that we will be able to witness uh, a really marked change on our next generations. Uh, thank you guys so much for, for for sharing. So the next question, you can take this as like a one word answer type of thing or elaborate as, as much as you want, but it's just how do each of you guys personally uh, racially identify? And that can be whether like which box you check when you're in the US or when you're when you're in your country of origin where maybe the concept of racial identity is different. You know, for me, for me, it's really funny because I'm born in Romania, you know, so it's everybody thinks it's a fake passport. Like, every, I'm like, why am I going to fake a fake Romanian passport? Like, there's <laughs> that's not, doesn't work, you know, so it's it's really funny, like how like, every time I travel, it's always like a thing like, a, you know, Bucharest, why are you born? You know, it's like a whole thing. But um, but for me, it's 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 I, I definitely I, I identify. As, 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 as African and, and as Arab uh, because of you know, my culture, because of you know, how, how I grew up and, and so on. It's, it's really funny because I have to explain it uh, a lot of times to both Arabs and Africans. Like, you know, Arabs ask me, you know, you speak Arabic and, and Africans ask me, why do you speak Arabic? You know, so it's always like, I always have to explain myself. And that's, and that's, that's the situation for Sudan as a whole because you know, our culture, uh, most of Sudan or central Sudan, and even the governmental system, the education system is, is, is very Arab and it's very pan-Arabist and, and all of that. But, you know, we, we have, especially now, like at least in the last, I, I would say since the eighties, we've totally um, disappeared from, from the media. You know, we don't, we don't have media and our history is totally um, neglected even by us, you know? And, and, and the situation in Sudan is the same situation in Mauritania, let's say, you know, like nobody knows anything about Mauritania, right? So it's, it's everybody, you have to explain yourself all the time. And as a Sudanese, you find yourself explaining that all the time, you know, that, we, you know, the, okay, so, um, you know, uh, Anwar Sadat, his mother was Sudanese, right? Mohammed Najib, the first president of Egypt, was actually born in Sudan, right? Uh, Muhammad Munir, all of these, all of these, all of these people, like Ahmed Zeki, you know, all of all of these people, uh, you know, one of the, the most famous, actually, you know, media people in Egypt, where you know, which is the biggest Arab, you know, Arab media center, and you know, or was or still is, is is uh, are are Sudanese, right? But uh, you know, the the, the twist is is that you know. Um, People in Sudan don't know that, and people in Egypt don't know that, and people in the Arab world don't know that. So it, it was a, you know, it was, it's a constant struggle really to, to, to answer that question. You know, uh, it's, not, it's not easy at all. I mean, to pick up from the struggle, I also struggle in terms of thinking about my identity, um, but I, I primarily, um, identify um, as uh, someone from Queens, New York, as a New Yorker, um, as an Egyptian, um, as a woman of color, as a brown woman, um, and as a child of immigrants. And, and it's something that I think about in terms of like how I show up, right, as someone who does racial justice work, thinking about both the ways in which I experience racism, right, in, in a white supremacist context, but then also in the ways in which I uphold um, and perpetuate racism as a non-Black person um, and how, you know, in communities and various communities I'm a part of need to reflect on and think about um, my own education um, as an Egyptian um, with the various identities that I carry. As for me, uh, it's just uh, the past one year of being in the USA. Otherwise, all my life, life was here in Sudan, in Khartoum. But maybe uh, something uh, interesting is that I was raised in the UK when I was a child, when I was a kid, and I go to a school, a nursery school, and a primary school there. I remember I was, 
um, I was given the name of chocolate because maybe I was the only uh, colored person in the class at that time. So, uh, and this, this name was, it continued because uh, I have my father's friend when they come home, oh, chocolate, you are here. So <laughs> I think uh, at that time, I don't know what's the meaning. And I, I was not angry. I, I just have this name of chocolate and it continues for a long time, for a long time. But um, as in Sudan, as you see, within the same family, you can find different shades of color, starting from the white colors, you can find uh, brown, maybe bronze, you can find different shades in the same family. So if you want to in, uh, introduce your cousin, sometimes they, for example, in school, I had my cousin who, who is really uh, so white. She's a near cousin, but she's so white. And the teacher always say, are you cousins? Yes, we are cousins, but how come? Then you have to explain because we are not, uh, our grandfather, our grandmothers are not the same because my grandfather had many wives. So one of them was, has an origin from Turkey and my mother's origin, my grandmother's origin is from this country. So you have to explain to clarify this matter. Uh, so I think, um, I think by time people are going to be aware of these differences and these different colors and different uh, tribal uh, groups and things like that. So we hope when we come a time that then we're not going to differentiate according to color or to tribes or to things like that. So we are just people. We are all people and uh, uh, nothing uh, only as Prophet Muhammad say, only the good deed that's going to differentiate, differentiate us from each other. Um, thank you guys. So this next question uh, is, is uh, I think a chance to inspire other people, but primarily it's also a chance to flex. Um, you guys all work in in different areas and uh and and like that you know that, that all combines to you being people who are like qualified to speak at this and who are are really um informed about these issues and so i wanted to ask each of you individually in your um area of work what like like what do you think for example how did you can do as an artist or what do you think the role of artists is in this issue um and, and similarly, Ijdad with, with urban planners. Um, so, Khaled, you can start. You know, a, a, an, an artist's role is always to, to tell stories, you know, to tell, to tell history, to, to, you know, reflect a point of view, to make, uh, you know, something, uh, especially for political cartoonists, you make something that's very huge into one panel and make people, you know, have a discussion about it. So it's 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 uh, for me it's um, um, that's that's my work that's what I do daily and that's what I've been doing for the last decade you know and it's it's uh, it's um, it, you know creating you know it, it's it's about creating a discussion it's about um, having people who are with you people who are not with you and and creating a discussion between the, the two people and that was and because i work online i work i i i only work online actually i, I never work in a newspaper but the thing is that um you know now with with basically with algorithms and on in, in, in social media it's very it's like you know you create your own ecosystem kind of thing and you're not um we're not creating those discussions anymore so for me when i do something like you know cap like uh, you know the, the drawing I did about Kaepernick that went viral, and you know everybody's like using it and so on. But it's the people that like my work are the people who are liking it. You know, so we're not we're not creating in any of that discussion anymore. So that's that's the bit that I I kind of miss. Uh, but that's the main point of my work. You know, so it's it's really it's really confusing right now. Actually, like, well, am I doing the right thing? Am I just kind of like making? Um, uh, am I just, you know, are we all clapping for each other? Are people with the same mindset? What are we, you know, what are we doing? So that's, that's the, um, that's, that's what I'm going through right now. But it's, it's my, you know, it's what I do. And this is what artists do to begin with. 
you know, is to tell the times, is to tell the history, is to tell what's what's going on, and especially politi political cartoonist or editorial cartoonist. Um, I could jump in also as, as from the perspective of an organizer, I think my role within in doing racial justice work is thinking through what policy levers and what strategies um, are important to be able to shift the realities of people um, and their lived experience. And so right now, um, what Black Lives Matter in the US and the movement for Black Lives is asking for um, is uh, defunding police, right? That is the main call to action. And that is what folks are organizing around. As a New Yorker, uh, my, main, my main role in the organizing I'm doing is thinking about how we're mobilizing Arab community, Muslim community in New York City to put pressure on their local representatives to demand um, New York City representatives to defund police by July 1st. So it's very strategic. And I th but I think more so than that is, is shifting hearts and minds, right? Trying to convince people um, and trying to tell a story that feels resonant with our community, with our community leaders, in which they will feel the need to care about this issue enough to make that demand, to feel the need to care about this issue enough to talk about it, right, in community, um, to be aware of how they could reflect on their own practices. I think organizing is really about relationship building, is really about education work, it's really about policy change, um, and that it takes the breadth of many um, areas. It's it's very challenging. It's it's very um, deeply rooted conversations. And I'll give you an example. Um, tomorrow we're doing an allyship day through the nonprofit I run. Um, and there's like almost 400 people who are signed up to int interested in doing this work of like, how do they show up, right? Um, and there's, we, we have one that's specifically for Arabs, non-Black Arabs specifically, and, and the way in which the space will be, will be facilitated is going to, it's going to be very hard asking people to really reflect on the ways in which they contribute to anti-Blackness, right? And, and that's an uncomfortable conversation to have um, because you have to check the ways in which you do harm and you perpetuate violence, which people don't like to be in that position to really think about what, you know, how they're upholding these systems. And so, so, so I think that that's a lot of the work is like this, these conversations, this dialogue, this training, um, political action, and and anyone who's an organizer right now is also thinking about similar types of things. Uh, building on Rana, uh, I can I can speak about. Uh, from my own perspective or from my own uh, specialized specialization or from other perspectives uh, awareness i think awareness is very important uh, the simplest uh, the simplest awareness uh, uh, talk is for girls who are going to, who are doing bleach for their colors despite despite the health issues associated with this matter they go on doing this bleach so i think awareness can start from this point. Uh, other, um, the art, the literature, all these have a great role to play. The role urban planning can do to combat uh, the, the, this issue of racial inequality is great, is great. There are many tools which I can use as an urban planner to, to tackle this problem and hopefully to arrive at solutions. Uh, starting from um, uh, social gathering spaces, uh, land tenure, affordable housing within neighborhoods, how uh, anything that I can bring uh, people together and let them be accepted, each, each one to accept the other. So I think this is a, a separate webinar of the role of urban planning on combating such issue. So uh, that's it from my I just want to like highlight like one really cool sentence that each of them said just to to emphasize how 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 exciting these speakers are. Khaled said my drawing that went viral and then Rana said the 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 nonprofit I run and then Ijlada said, this is enough for a separate webinar. So like, these are the kind of people that, that we're talking to right now. Um, but next question. Uh, also, um, we, are, we are getting uh, 
pretty close to the time that I wanted to open up uh, for audience questions. We have a couple questions coming in from the Q&A, but we also have a couple prepared questions. So if if we could try to keep the answers like very dense so that they you get a lot out, um, but, but we're able to fit in as much as possible, that would be ideal. But I, also no rush. We don't have to answer every question if we're answering the important ones thoroughly. Um, the next question uh, relates to something that Khaled mentioned when uh, talking about uh, the way that our parents grew up with these, with a lot of these ideas as normalized and that it's not talked about in the, um, in the marriage problem uh, and, and how, and how it's, it's, and how it's very, how it disproportionately, um, how, how it is disproportionately difficult for, for, um, for, for people uh, of darker skin color to, to get married, especially, especially women. Um, and the question is how, how do you talk to the, 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 the older generation about this where they have grown up with this beauty standard of, of like find yourself somebody light to marry um, or, 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 or in our communities where there are some countries that, that I've, I just found this out recently. Some people use the word habit to like mean black and like that's you know things like that like how do you talk to people who grew up with that kind of of uh of of, of environment as normal you know it's uh, it's it's really um it's really interesting because I, I, I grew up in Sudan for a bit when I, um, and, then I and then I went to Qatar, I, went to, I lived in Doha. So um, it's really interesting because in Sudan I'm considered, or Iqbal as well I would say, uh, we're, we're both considered the Arab, you know? We're from the Arab tribes, we're considered the oppressor basically, you know? And I, I, I heard that word growing up a lot, you know? And from very educated people, you'll be surprised, you know? And, you know, what I do, you know, you hear it normal, right? Um, and then I traveled, like when, I, when we went to live in Doha, and then I started hearing about me, right? So yeah, it's, it, was, it, was, uh, it was something very interesting because it was eye-opening really, because it's, you know, I think a lot of things, um, you, you, you know, you start putting yourself in somebody else's shoes when you're, you know, when you, when you see what happens at first degree, you know, like it, I, I, I became the oppressor and the oppressed, like I've seen both sides, you know, so it's, it's really, um, it, it's, it's, it's very normalized. It's, it's absolutely normalized and you'll be surprised. It's, it's, um, uh, so that's why when I see now young, you know, Arabs or young white guys or whatever saying it, it's, I'm upset because they're young. You know, if like a, a 60 year old, some, you know, a 60 year old white man or a 60 year old Arab or 70 year old, whatever would say that, you know, that's the way that he was raised up. I'm not gonna change his mind and I'm not gonna expect him. Like, I'll be surprised if he's not like that. I'll be surprised if he's not racist, you know? But when a, a, a young person is like that, this is, when I'm, this is when I'm really confused. I'm like, why, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense, right? So yeah, it's a, it, it was a, it was a definitely a very interesting experience. And I, as I said, you know, you have, and I guess a lot of the Arabs feel it as well when they, you know, when they, when they travel as well, when they live outside and then they come back home and they see the, they see the differences, you know? And in Sudan it's very tribal, of course, because as Iqbal said, in one, in one family, you see all shades of color, you know, because of the mixing and Sudan is a, is, it's, it's huge. And it was a, it was a, it was a it was a mixing ground. It was a you know everybody everyone came here to work, so it's there was a there was a lot of mixing tribes. So yeah, that's that's my um, that's my take on it. Yeah, I, I would I would reflect similarly. Like you know, as as an Egyptian American, I I feel like my family also and from an extended level is very variant racially, right? Like. There's a lot of different colors in, in my family across the board, different racial identities in my family across the board. Um, and you and I grew up seeing that, right? Seeing like what type of hair texture is favored, what what skin color is favored. Um, seeing um, fair and lovely being like thrown on some cousins and 
like, you know, not, us not wanting to, don't go into the sun, even though we're, we live in Alexandria and don't get tan, like that was the language. Um, and then being in like in a, in a mixed race neighborhood growing up in New York and growing up in Queens and seeing the same type of language um, being used in a derogatory way, both Arabs using both the N-word, um, thinking that, well, because I'm African, like I could use the N-word even if they're not black, right? Or um, thinking because they're like working class or low income, they could use the N-word even though they're not black as, as a racial slur. Um, and then also recently learning um, the the racialization and the language in the Arab context as well, right? And I think language, checking language is super important because language can do so much harm in terms of the ways in which people internalize um, messaging for themselves, but also for you, like how you perceive other people based on language that you use, right? And that type of dehumanization on a subconscious level also carries out into your treatment of people, right? So the moment that you are angry and you flip out on someone you kind of go beneath and you use that type that type of um, perception and that creates like deep rifts and deep conflicts and and shows you how you've internalized oppressive mentality even if you do experience various levels of oppression and i do think it is important to have these conversations openly with our families like sometimes i'll be watching an, any egyptian movie and any Egyptian movie has some sort of racialized blackface, right? And 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 making it like a commitment in my own household with my family that we're not going to consume these type this type of content, right? Even if it means we don't watch Egyptian media anymore because all of it is racist, but we really can't consume this type of information. And being really hard and steadfast on that and pushing back against that is important. Um, and then and then be, not being shy from those uncomfortable conversations because that education work has to happen. In your family, you have to know your history, right? You have to know um, the ways in which your identity formulated, and then you, you learn that for yourself, and then that teach that to the people around you, because that's how change, I believe, on a micro scale will happen, and then we'll be able to permeate out. And so, being committed to that individually is really important. I I think. I think uh, home is the place where we can start this change because uh, the children are really affected by what they hear from their parents. Even those, the white children are affected because they go to school and then they go on bullying the black uh, children. So I think at home then there should be a different, uh, 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 different way of bringing up the children by praising all ethnic groups, all tribes, all colors, and even featuring for the black children, featuring the, 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 the beauty of the, this ebony color or this bronze color and how they were able to, for example, we have a lot of uh, figures who were able to, to have, uh, for example, example they were journalists they were models they were they they got prizes in the literature so they, they did not stop even they were oppressed by the community they did not stop and they were able to proceed and to go on uh, as for the older age i think uh, as long as prophet muhammad said that there is no difference between colors and ethnicity and things then there is no nothing to say more then we have to go back to these sayings of Prophet Muhammad all the time. I think by time they will be able to grasp and uh, uh, for the older generations. But the younger generation, I think they are going on this way. Uh, if at home we are going to make these teachings and uh, try to preserve the good things or we try to, to, to reflect the good things and the, how the black people were able to to go and uh, make, uh, for example, they were successful, they were able to be journalists, they had prices and things like that. I think this is one of the way maybe we can be able to tackle this issue. Yeah, and, and if you don't mind, if I could just interject, I think the point you just made was super powerful because I just keep thinking as you were talking about the case of Shukri Abdi, and I don't know if folks, anyone has heard of her story, but she was a 12-year-old girl whose family had just migrated from Somalia three years ago to the UK um, and was experiencing bullying in her school where, you know, the kids would make fun of her and they would 
make fun of her for like many reasons, her racial background, her, her Muslim background. And ultimately their last point in bullying was pushing her into a river. And unfortunately she died, she, she um, got killed and her family has been fighting for the past. So there's that, right? Like clearly these 12 year old kids learned racism from somewhere, right? These white 12 year old kids learned racism from somewhere that they're then bringing into their school and murdering another kid um, in a Western context, right? And then the second level is then what does the judicial system look like? The state then didn't prosecute anyone, right? They closed the case and didn't bring any justice to the family. And so then there's two levels, right? There's the level of, on an individual level, this, this child like died because of this violence, because of anti-Blackness. And then on a state level, the system is not, it doesn't care about this human life, again, because of anti-Blackness, right? And you see many um, Black um, British folks right now are fighting um, for the rights of her family to really, to find justice in this case. But I, I just, just want to plus 100 what you said in terms of starting with children and making sure that these sentiments are permeating um, and aren't continued to the next generation. The laws and regulations also, they have a role also. The, uh, yes. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you guys so much. Um, and the last question I'm going to ask before we move on to audience questions, which are coming in, uh, all attendees either drop a question or upvote a question that you like so that we can get to the, the, the coolest ones first. Um, uh, so the last question that we're going to, we're going to, uh, talk about is we've, we've seen something like this before where there is a social media sparked resistance uh, against an unjust government in the Arab Spring. And we have seen the ways that different countries involved uh, approached their, their, their fights. And, and now we're, we're years out uh, of that. And we, we've seen what the, the aftermath has looked like in different places. What do you guys think that we can learn from that as like a case study or a few case studies of 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 this kind of 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 of, of like of a fight for justice about what works and what doesn't and how do you think we can use that to inform what actions we take here now? It's um. You know, as a, as a political cartoonist, I started my work during the during the Arab Spring, just like many other you know um, Arab um, creatives, um, from like street artists to filmmakers and so on. Um, what you know, and we've seen this happen. I personally like you know what happened in 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 the Arab Spring, and then it happened twice after that in Sudan for us to have the revolution that we that we just had last year. So. Uh, the way how things um, normally just progress is that it's exactly what happened during Occupy or the first wave of like Black Lives Matter or whatever. But at you know it's it's a uh, sadly news and 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 the revolution becomes entertainment, you know, and it's it's all about like if you if you if you remember like a few weeks ago. It was all Corona, right? Like we'll be having this talk about, you know, like the COVID nineteen. What are we going to do? This is going to change everything, blah, 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 right? And then everything changed. Now this is about this. So it's it's not. We don't transition easily to other things. We just cut whatever we were talking about and go to the other thing. Like literally, it's like somebody goes cut, you know, and then let's talk about something else. So what happens with that? This is this is the danger in 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 these situations in, in in people that are trying to change things as a whole, right? When, when, when this transition happens, people get bored because they know that this is not, this, this is not what, I, what I should be, this is not the trending hashtag right now. I, you know, I need to be with the trending hashtag. So the danger is getting, you know, if people get bored and if media gets bored of this, then it's done, it's out, right? So our biggest fear during the revolution in Sudan was that what if something else happens? Like there was, you know, there was a there was a deal, and because everybody was talking about Sudan, you know, the young girl who was on top of the car wearing the nice, you know, Sudanese dress, and 
everybody was talking about that. The pictures that were coming out of Sudan were beautiful, the music, everything, you know? And then so something started happening in Lebanon and everybody was like, oh, you know, where, which one is cooler, you know? Where, and, and, and that's the thing. So now we, I, the only thing that should happen is that we should not let this die off. This should, this should, this should, this should keep trending. This should keep happening. And we, to, on, a way of, on a way to a solution, like we should find results as soon as possible because people now are just, it's, it's, we live in a Twitter age, you know, you have like five seconds to grab my attention or I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling, you know, that's, that's, that's it. And it's, and it's all about, you know, the activism, even that people are out now, but how long are you gonna have, have people out? And this is what happened during, you know, during the sit-in in, in Tahrir, during the sit-in in Rabat, during the sit-in in Yemen, in, in Sudan, it's at the end, they'll come out and say, oh, these are drug dealers, these are like looters, these are, you know, whatever they're like having sex on the whatever they're having so it's just it this is gonna happen and then you know it's just, you know they use the same tactics and activists use the same tactics because what how how are we learning this is the issue how are we learning because every time you have a new crowd in each of these episodes you have a new crowd how are we going to be one step ahead that's the main issue how are things how are we going to make sure that things change you know it's the same thing that was everybody was talking about during covid right this is going to change everything everything it's like the fall of capitalism da, da, da. but you know is 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 it really you know and that that's 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 what's happening right now okay so we abolish the police uh defund the police uh move on okay what what are we doing let's get registrators let's do this let's do that you know so it's so we show that we're serious revolution is is about taking the next step and i think this is one thing i've learned is, is this is that people get bored really quickly and there's there's tactics to for people to you know make you forget and make you the enemy. So if you ever talk about this again, you'll be uh, you know why are you still talking about this? I thought we were over this. You know this was last week. You know so that's that's the thing. I think that's the most important part is we have to come up with solutions very fast. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think what's really promising though this time is is that there are concrete shifts that are happening that we're seeing unfold in the U.S. and commitments that are being made. So for example, you know, the um, disbanding the Minneapolis police um, is, is an important advancement as an example of what can happen across the US, the demands to defund, right? Where we're, we're, we're moving money and divesting money from policing and, and putting it into education and community service is also something that's sustained, right? Um, I think um, calls around uh, how do we think about, you know, inclusion and diversity at various levels of leadership where it's, where it's truly systemic change, right? And it's not just um, that clickbait that you're talking about where corporate is just putting out a statement, but really demanding and asking corporate institutions and government institutions, how are they shifting power, right? Like, where are you putting, how are you making sure that there are black people in the room when you are making important and key decisions around distribution of power, around distribution of wealth, right? around policy decisions and using this moment to demand these things right now that are going to be sustained in the long long term. Um, and, and I'm seeing it even like when we're talking about venture capital, right? I'm seeing it when we're talking about, um, you know, hiring and employment in different institutions. I'm seeing it when we're talking about who, who's getting elected and elections and who's going to be in the cabinet of certain, certain elected, right? It's, it's, it's trying to diversify how we're talking about um, where anti-blackness is pervasive and making sure that it is, um, that the change is structural, exactly what you're saying. Um, and then the second thing is actually, I, I do feel like even though there are challenges around new activism and new waves of activism where people might feel burnt out or they might also drown out or, or, or you know, take a step back after the hype, I, I find that this time feels a little different in the sense that like, no one is ignoring it. And I don't know if it's the mix of the corona pandemic where like there's like 20 million people unemployed and so now people have time to be in revolution in the US versus before. Um, or if it's just like the, you know, the real effectiveness of the organizing that's taking place. But the sentiment on the ground here in the US is that folks do feel like this is different. Um, and there is some real change that is coming, which I'm hopeful does happen <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, that, that's that's definitely the new thing because um you know we always had something that that fueled these revolutions whether it's like uh unemployment rates or uh you know like the the price of bread or what something happened that made everything flip 
and in in the in the U.S. it was that it was it was the the you know the kind of the crush of the economy, uh, the pandemic. Everybody's at home. Everybody's scared. They needed change. They thought about change. But again, you know, it's like it's if you if you look at all of these things, something happens, something blow up, but then they they take out the fire in different ways. So I you know I I I really admire what you just said about there's there's a lot of movement right now and especially about the defund the police. I, I love that movement. That's that's incredible. And I think that should be global. Trigger. So um, I want to I want to take you back to the protest site in the headquarters of the uh, armed forces. Each saying by this use, each saying is a concept by itself. So, for example, they were saying we want our uh, the the, pr the, uh, the prices, uh, the value of our uh, uh, pound to be two dollars as it was before. We want our country to be the basket of food for the whole world. So, one of the sayings was, "Why did you separate South Sudan? You are arrogant." You, Al Bashir, you are arrogant. Why did you separate South Sudan? Another saying was, uh, "We are all Darfur. You know, Darfur is the place where uh, I don't know what to say, but Darfur is uh, it, it, it represents the racism in my country." So they were telling the president, Omar Al Bashir, "We are all Darfur." You are arrogant. You are. Uh, I don't know what they were saying, but we are all Darfur. So I think these sayings, if we start from there, we can build on them. We can build on these sayings, and I think we're going to arrive at solutions, and we're going to go on instead of just neglecting them and dropping them there at the site. So uh, these two sayings are very strong, and they were adopted by the youth. So I think we can start from there and try to build on these things. And I think we're going to arrive at solutions. All right, so we uh, have time for one audience question, but luckily there is one that was the most, like by far the most highly upvoted. Um, and that question is what should white passing Arabs do to use their white privilege to make change? Also, we will get to the other questions on our social media after this, but we want to We'll make sure to let you guys out on time. Um, I'm happy to I'm happy to start with the white Arab past the white person Arab. First of all, I think we need to like I think white Arabs need to recognize that they are white Arabs. I think there's a lot of like I don't think there's a conversation um, at least in the Arab American community around the racialization of Arabness, right? Around the fact that there are various racial makeups within one community. Um, and you see that constantly with the conversation around the census, right, where there's an erasure of racial identity, where Arabs, you know, there's proposals to create a MENA category as one racial category, um, which is not reflective of the true racial makeup. So I would say recognizing that there are mixed race Arabs, that there are black Arabs, that there are white Arabs, which you, you have said. And I think that on top of that, like doing doing the work to, to realize like how much space you're taking up, right? In predominantly Arab spaces. I think a lot of predominantly Arab spaces, um, the face of those spaces, the face of like anything Arab oftentimes are white passing Arabs. Um, and, and, then, and then when you bring, um, you know, like I, I, I was talking about this earlier, like when, I'm, when I bring um, black Arabs into a space or my black friends into a space or I'm coming into a space, like I've personally experienced racism, even as a brown um, light skinned Arab, like w experience racism at the hand of white passing Arabs, right? Like I, and, and so I think doing the work both for white passing Arabs but also for brown Arabs to interrogate our identity, to interrogate our positionality is super important. Opening up space for Afro and Black Arabs to be able to actually, you know, so that we're not taking up all the space and they, like there is actual space to center those voices is super important. Um, and, and I think like doing the work to understand our own histories, right, and understand um, the ways in which we're perpetuating and continue to perpetuate anti-Blackness is also something that's super important.
Um, so if, uh, if our other speakers don't have anything to share on that question, our last, last, last question um, is just to, to, to wrap things up. Um, also, just a reminder again, we will get to all, the rest of the audience questions on our social media. Um, but our last question for you guys here now is if you, so, so we've talked about a lot of different things and I think we touched on a lot of topics that each could become its own, its own webinar and we could talk about for another hour. Um, but if you have one takeaway, preferably in one sentence, uh, that, that, that you want the audience to get from this, like what do you want the people watching to, to, to have stuck in their heads when they log off? So can I start speaking? So I think uh, there should be change, obviously there should be change and we should all start working together uh, as Arab, as youth, we should work together uh, in order to be able to achieve this change. For sure there should be change. Uh, we should go uh, front, we should not go back and all these uh, sayings and methodologies which are embedded in our uh, past generations, we should be able to clear them, to clarify them, and so as to be able to move forward to build our nations. And I think we should respect the, the person as a person. He's, after all, he's a person. We should not look at his color or ethnicity or tribal affiliation or something. It's just a person which we should respect. Um, I could go next. So I, I would just say centering um, the asks of black organizers right now who are leading um, the movement for, for black lives and Black Lives Matter, which is to defund police. And so I loved what Khaled said. I wish this was a global movement and it should be because the prison industrial complex is a global phenomena. Um, but any, any work, anyone who's based in the US calling on your city council members, calling on your government, your governors, um, anyone who's making budgeting decisions, your controller um, to take resources from policing and divert them to other institutions that could support um, what policing currently does unnecessarily. Um, like mental health services, like education, like stimulus to the economy, um, is is like the is the main ask, and and I I do hope that folks are supporting that ask. And Khaled. You know, it's it's a uh, just try to change. You know, <laughs> try to uh, try to come out of that square. Uh, it's hard, it's definitely hard, but you know, it's, uh, it's up to you now. Whose side do you want to be on? That was concise, powerful. <laughs> I like it. Um, okay, so that's all the time that we have. Thank you guys so, so, so much. I spent most of my time like fangirling, but, but I, I have been super excited. This is amazing. I hope everybody watching uh, learned a lot. Uh, check out, this will be posted on, I think our YouTube um, for if you missed part of it. Um, and the rest of the questions will be answered on our social media um, soon, inshallah. So yeah, thank you guys so, so, so much. Thank you for having us. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.